Okay, so the moment you've all been waiting for, other than hearing my beautiful voice, we are going to introduce our friend here, Maddie Beard. Ah, Maddie is a strategic designer currently working as an Adobe Creative Resident. Her focus, UI UX design in wellness space. Empathy, cognitive psychology, and digital well-being are all driving forces behind her work. Take it away, Maddie. Thank you, Andre. Right. Let's share this presentation. All right. Yay. Hello, everybody. It's so good to be here again. Um, I gave a presentation with UX Wizard just a few weeks ago on mindful design. Um, so it's really good to be back talking about foundational research basics. So to introduce myself again, I'm Maddie. And as Andre mentioned, I am a creative resident at Adobe this year. We already talked a little bit about what my focus is, but this year in my residency, I'm exploring ways to help people achieve their wellness goals using tech and at the same time, actively designing products to promote more mindful tech use. Something that I feel like is really important, especially at a time like this when we're all at home, spending lots of time on technology. All right, but enough about me. Let's get into what we're going to be talking about today. So just before I even get into the agenda, I just want to say that this talk is really supposed to be kind of um, action, you know, based. I don't want you to just walk away with an understanding of what foundational research is, but I want you to walk away with a little bit of confidence to actually start doing this yourself, whether it is within your company for a freelance client or just for your own personal project. So I'm going to talk about what it is, going to introduce what foundational research is used for as well as the methods, but then we're really going to get into the action steps. So how to conduct background research, write your research plan, write your discussion guide, recruit the right participants for your studies, and then we will end with a few quick interview tips. And then of course, leave some time for Q&A. So if you do have any questions that come up throughout this presentation, definitely put them in the question box and we will get to them at the end. Okay, so first things first, let's introduce a little bit about what foundational research is and what some of the methods are. So to describe what this is, I think it's the most helpful to contrast it with directional research. So these are sort of the two pieces of the research puzzle, foundational and directional. Foundational research helps you figure out exactly where you want to go. Directional research helps you figure out exactly how to get there. It answers more specific questions and it's usually a shorter process than foundational research, which is a little bit longer and more broad and open-ended. And so it kind of goes without saying here that foundational research should come first. It should lay the foundation for the rest of your project. It centers around a problem that has not clearly been defined yet. So after your foundational research, then you'll know exactly what problem you are setting out to solve. The goal is to understand the user's needs, goals, and motivations around whatever topic you are researching into. So let's look at the methods and how they kind of complement and contrast with each other. So for foundational research, um, the most common method is user interviews. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today is user interviews. But to introduce you to some other ones, there are also focus groups. So this is similar, but it happens in a group setting and people can kind of feed off of each other and have conversations that we can you know, all learn from. Kind of hard to do in a COVID situation unless you're doing that over um, a video conferencing app. We have ethnography, which are field studies done in the natural environment that the person would be using the product in. And so this is something that is one of my favorite methods, but at the moment with COVID, it's very hard to do this type of research 
field studies have to be done in a specific environment. And so you have to be with the person that you are testing with in person in the right kind of setting. So while I do love that research method, we're not focusing on that today because it would be pretty tricky for you to conduct that type of research right now. Next, we have diary studies. So this is when data is self-reported by a participant over a set period of time. So you set really specific goals and they will self-report the data and um, kind of deliver it to you at the end of that set period of time. Competitive testing is exactly what it sounds like. You are testing the products of your competitors. Stakeholder interviews, again, pretty self-explanatory. This is more business related usually. So you're talking to the stakeholders, whether that be um, your client or someone funding the project, any stakeholders of the project to learn more about the goal. Next is support interviews. So this is when you are really talking to the people who are on the support or sales team. Um, at, a at a product you know, company um, in order to understand what people are asking questions about and what people are really struggling with, what problems seem to come up a lot. So let's contrast that with some of the directional research methods such as task analysis. So this is much more specific. You're choosing a specific task that you are analyzing how a user goes about completing that task. Next is A-B experiments. So oftentimes this is done to see if interface A or B will yield more conversions, which personally I don't think is super ethical, but you can also do this in a different way where you can test which interface A or B helps someone um, achieve their own goal um, as a user of the product. Prototype testing, so this is once you've already done your prototype for a specific project and you are testing it out. So again, these things are all very specific. Accessibility evaluation, just what it sounds like, you are evaluating the accessibility of your product based on accessibility rules and standards. Usability testing, same thing, except thinking about usability best practices and making sure that your product is um, coming to those standards. So while all of these are really important, it's also important to remember that you should always be willing to pivot. So when it comes to research, maintain autonomy. Just because you start off during um, or in one method doesn't mean you can't kind of swap around and do what's best for the project. Don't mindlessly follow one process or method but be flexible and always be thinking about the specific project at hand. Okay, so like I mentioned, today we're gonna to be focusing on user interviews. And like I said, one of the reasons is because it's one of the most common um, foundational research methods, but also I think it is the one that you can really start to do at any level and to sort of get better and better at it, especially during a time like this um, with COVID, you can have these types of interviews virtually very easily. So when it comes to user interviews, there are a few different ways you can conduct them. They can be really structured, semi-structured, or completely unstructured. So we're gonna be focusing on the semi-structured kind today. And I like to really just refer to those as conversational interviews. You come with an idea of what you're going to be talking about, a discussion guide, but you're really open-ended with where the conversation can go. Um, so that's why we call it semi-structured. I just like to refer to it as a conversational interview. Like I said, it's really great for a time like this during COVID, but it also gives you a nice well-rounded picture of your user or potential users. Um, and helps you create empathy because you are really speaking with and getting to know the people that um, are using your product. Okay, so now that you have a little bit of background into foundational research, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of actually the process for conducting this. 
So I always start with a little bit of background research before I start to get into my actual study. So what should you look into whenever you're doing your background research? You should get to know the industry a little bit. So really broadly, what industry does your product or product idea fall into? Um, who are the big players? Kind of what are the values there? What is happening in the industry right now? How did it begin? Where is it at, you know, at this time? A specific company. So whether you are working for a specific company um, or you are coming up with a completely new concept, you should kind of explore that idea in general. So if you are working for a company, you want to learn about um, what that company does. Is it a new company? Um, what is sort of the process that they use? Do they already have a product? That kind of thing. What brands dominate in the industry and why are they dominating? Who are they going after? What are they accomplishing? What challenges do they face? Competitors. So this is specifically if you are working for a company, look at their competitors. Um, so this is different from dominating brands because this could be maybe a startup. So it wouldn't be competing with the biggest brands. It would be competing with um, some smaller startups. And what about user demographics? Look at who is using this type of product, who is in the industry, and even broader, you can look at the psychographics too. What are their interests? What do they have in common? What are their values? That types of things. So to clarify this idea even further, I'm going to introduce you to a recent project of mine. So this is Essence. Essence is a smart diffuser app that promotes mindfulness through automation. So the idea behind the app is to facilitate the creation of rituals that prime your environment for a certain parts of your day using aromatherapy. So an example may be you want to set up a ritual where your diffuser diffuses calming oils every day at 530 to signal to your body that it's time to log off of work and start to wind down. So that was the end result of Essence, but let's back up and look at the background research for that project. So what I did, as you can see here, is I looked at the industry, the larger markets, where they exist in the world, what are some big players in the market, what are some other small companies that I'm seeing on social media, um, who is coming out with a smart diffuser already, um, what personas am I seeing in the marketing, all of that type of stuff. And I'm also coming up with some questions. So I am thinking about what my research goals might be, what information I might be missing, what gaps um, have kind of made themselves clear throughout my research so far so that I can better um, be informed for my study. And just to throw this in there, I think this is a really good time to remind yourself of your vision and values. So whether you were just coming up with a concept that you want to maybe make a reality later, this is a personal project, or whether you are working for a company, you really want to step back and think about what the vision and the values are. What values do you want to be creating with this product? So there are just a few examples of some different values here. Of course, there are tons of other things that you could think of, but this process will just help you keep the product human-centered. If you start human-centered, then it will be so much easier to keep the product human-centered as you go forward. Okay, so once you've done that, you've kind of gotten your values at top of mind then you can start writing your research plan. So for your research plan, first you wanna think about your research goals. So goals, motivations, beliefs, desires, expectations, are these things that you want to get to know and exactly in what context do you want to learn about these? Do you want to learn about the environment, the context, the scenarios that the product would be used in or already is used in? Do you want to learn about a person's current experience, challenges, barriers with a certain product, 
all of that type of thing. So these are all really broad, but you want to get specific with them in terms of your actual project. And I'm going to show you in a bit what my research goals look like for Essence to give you, excuse me, a more concrete example. But for now, let's move on to methodology. So here for your research plan, you want to define what the methodology will look like. What type of interview or study will see? What participant tasks will you have, you know, your participants carry out, if any? What general topics of discussion will you include in this interview? What will be the length of the interview? And how will data be recorded? So just jotting all of these things down in your research plan is super helpful. Next is participant criteria. So what is important for your participant to have in order to be a good fit for your study? Should they use a specific product? Should they use it with a certain frequency? Um, should they fall into certain categories such as age, gender orientation, employment, um, or income? Should they have specific interests, knowledge, or experiences in certain areas? Um, do they need to have a certain living arrangement or be um, present in a certain environment in certain times? Do they need to have certain abilities, physical, mental abilities, or um, especially availability to participate in your study? So outline all of those things. And this is really going to help you when it comes time to recruit. We're going to refer specifically to this participant criteria within your research plan whenever it's time to recruit for your study. And lastly, you want to define your timeline and budget. So when will you recruit? When will you prep for the interviews? When will the study take place? How many people will participate? And how will you compensate your participants? This is especially important if you're working within a certain budget, but also it's important to just share this with your team if you have one. Um, to get everyone on the same page with the plan. Okay, so as I mentioned, I wanna show you my specific research plan for this um, aromatherapy project. So as you can see, it's not fancy. This is screenshots from a Google Doc. So it can simply just be um, a Google Doc like this. So let's look at my research goals. We have better understand the targets user the target user's motivations beliefs desires and expectations surrounding in-home aromatherapy better understand the environment and scenarios in which they use their essential oil diffuser learn what is missing from their current experience with the product and gather general data about their relationship with the concept of digital wellness so sort of how do they think about tech in terms of their wellness so like I said, these are things that are definitely more specific to my problem space. And so you definitely want to make sure that that is the case whenever you are doing work. And then let's move on to methodology and participant tasks. So figure out exactly how long the session should be. I determined mine should be 45 minutes. Should they be recorded? Um, and then here you can start to think about the specific topics. So for me, it was first I want to start by talking about their home environment, then their relationship to wellness and mindfulness, the rituals that happen in their home, their current experience with an essential oil diffuser, and their feelings about an app facilitating that experience. So high level topics here and followed by how you will choose which participants are important. So for me, they had to use essential oils in their home at least weekly. They should fall into an age range of 25 to 35. And that's just based on my research um, in how this type of product is marketed. They should be health and wellness conscious. And I also wanted them to have a variety of home ecosystems. I wanted to interview some people who live alone, some who live with roommates, some who live with a partner and some who live with young children. And of course, they should be available to attend a 45-minute virtual interview over video chat. 
And then here you can also see my timeline for when I was going to complete each of these tasks. Okay, so once you have that, then you can start to actually write your discussion guide. And what I normally do is do this in conjunction with my recruiting. So we'll go over this first, but just know that it's usually, it usually works well to be recruiting and have um, your posts kind of circulating the internet, recruiting the right people while you are nailing down the specifics of your discussion guide. So when it comes to your discussion guide, it's really important to start general and then get more specific as you go. And this goes for both during the interview as a whole, but also within each topic or section. So when you're introducing yourself and also during your recruiting, you should not get too specific. So for example, I never said aromatherapy or um, smart diffuser app during my introduction when I was like first starting to talk to the person. Um, and that's because I didn't want them to have any biases in their answers. I wanted them to be thinking more generally. And if they were going to bring up aromatherapy, I wanted them to do that in their own way so that I could naturally see how it fits into their life and their self-care routine. So again, you want them to answer without one specific topic in mind. That's why it's so important to go from general to specific. And this will also help you eliminate leading questions by staying really broad and keeping your questions as open-ended as possible. So we all know that leading questions are the number one thing to avoid um, as a UX researcher, but just in case you are brand new to UX research, what a leading question is, is a question that you ask that makes it really obvious what you want the person to say. So for example, a really obvious example would be so you use aromatherapy a lot at, throughout your day, right? Like you're basically telling them what to say. You um, make it really obvious what, how you want them to answer instead of asking a really open-ended question that allows them to answer in any way that they want. So a good way to avoid leading questions is by not asking any yes or no questions. Um, and that's also just a great way to get the conversation um, moving and keep it going in a productive way. So for my specific research for the, um, for Essence, this is just a way to describe this a little bit better. So I first started off with overall self-care questions. Then I went into aromatherapy about halfway through and then I started to mention the Smart Diffuser app and technology facilitating this in the last few questions. So that is how you can get, um, go from general to specific. And so this is my research guide. I'm obviously not gonna read the whole thing to you, but I did want to point out a couple things. So in the introduction, Basically what I'm doing here is introducing myself and making them kind of trust me, helping them trust me without telling them anything about my project. And that's again, to avoid biases. So let them know what to expect um, and ask them if it's okay if you record the session, but do not get too specific um, about the actual project. And the other thing I wanted to point out is just an example of how you can be general to too specific within one question. So you're going to be talking to uh, so many different types of people. Some people might be really open and um, like to talk. Other people might be a little bit more quiet and closed off and might answer just in one word or one sentence answers. So you have to be ready for both ends of the spectrum. So the best way to do that is by asking an overall question. So let's use this for an example. Tell me about your um, self-care practices. So that's really broad. Someone could go into a lot of different sort of tangents with that. So I start with that. If someone, um, you know, gives me a lot to go off of and a lot to talk about, then I can just keep asking some clarifying questions, questions that go deeper. But if they don't give me a whole lot, then I can move on to these subsequent questions. What wellness practices do you take part in regularly? And then I can ask why. 
I can ask, what does mindfulness mean to you? And how do you practice mindfulness? How or why? Um, I can ask, how have these change, things changed due to COVID, if at all? All of these things are things that could come up um, as they're just talking, but I may need to poke and prod a little bit in order to get them to go deeper into certain areas. Okay, so this is just the rest here. What I like to do is go through all of my different topics and um, like I said, get more nitty gritty as so in terms of what to ask, always including a why question in there. And then once I get through all of my overall topics that I plan to do in my research plan, then I will do a little bit of a conclusion. So I'll describe a little bit more about my project, but still not give away too, too much. Um, and then of course, I will wrap it up, ask them if they have questions and then send them the compensation that we discussed. Okay, so that is the discussion guide. It's so, so helpful to go in with something that is that specific. Um, so you really feel ready for every single interview that you do. Um, but in order to even do these interviews, you have to recruit the right participants. So how do you do that? You have to get in front of the right people. And unfortunately, right now we're living in a very digital world, which was already true, but now it's even more true due to COVID. So digitally, find out where these target um, demographics would hang out. So jot down some places and try to be specific. So what specific Facebook groups might you find them in? What specific Reddit threads might they be reading? Um, what Slack groups might they be in? Things like that. And if you don't have access to enough of the right people, reach out to influencers or people who might be willing to amplify your message. So quickly, I'll just say a quick example of how this happened to me. Um, back when I was recruiting for this study, I did not have a huge reach on social media. So as you can see, this post here only got 58 likes. And so I knew I wasn't reaching quite enough people and certainly not necessarily the right people. So what I did was I thought about an influencer or just someone with an audience on social media who might be willing to spread my message. So I reached out to this individual, her name is Victoria. I had been following her for a while. And she, um, I guess her value here is that she empowers women with knowledge about their bodies. And so I figured people who follow her are into self-care. Um, I could sort of make that fair assumption. And so I reached out, I sent her a message and she really kindly just shared my post and tons of people who I interviewed, about half of the people I interviewed actually came from her profile, which was super, super cool. And it was really nice of her to do that. But I do think that a lot of people are willing to help if you reach out and ask. So that's just an idea that you guys can do um, if you're looking to get a bigger reach for your recruitment. So before you actually go and post that and share your call for participants, make sure you create a screener survey of some kind. So. I did that here on Google Forms, but you can really do it wherever you want. And things you wanna remember for your screener survey are to collect the person's email. So make sure you do that because that's how you'll be reaching out to them um, if they're a good fit. And basically you wanna to refer to your participant criteria and kind of make your questions all about that. So think about what would make a good participant and what questions you can ask to see you know, if the person filling out the survey is a good fit. Keep it brief, you don't wanna waste people's time, just ask what you need to ask and nothing more. And also keep it somewhat vague. Like I said, you do not wanna give away your specific topic. So when I say keep it vague, here's an example of what I did. Instead of coming right out and saying, how often do you use aromatherapy? I said, how often do you engage in these um, self-care activities. I have journaling, aromatherapy, meditation, putting on face masks, and using bath bombs. So it sort of hides it in there and it's a little bit more ambiguous as to which one I'm targeting. And of course, I am targeting aromatherapy. So I only chose people who filled out that they use aromatherapy daily, two to four times a week, and weekly. 
And just as a little bit of background for my um, results, 107 of those people who responded, there were 120 total responses, 107 were women, uh, 68 were ages 25 to 35, and 59 of them used aromatherapy at least weekly. So when I sort of put all those together, I had 28 people to choose from who met all three of those criteria. And I interviewed 12 women who use aromatherapy at least weekly and live in these um, variety of ecosystems. And so I chose this grouping because I wanted to understand how environment and specifically who you live with might affect how you use aromatherapy. So let's wrap up with some really quick interview tips. So make sure when you're interviewing people that you're building rapport and being an active listener. So silence is great. It really gets people to continue talking, but don't forget to make the person feel comfortable by acknowledging them. Um, with nonverbal cues, um, like nods and eye contact, and even some verbal feedback, like, you know, that's really helpful, or that's so interesting, or thank you for sharing that. And also, you can hold the map, but let your interviewees take the wheel. So that's to say, let them be the expert. After all, they are the expert of their own experience. You'll be coming in with lots to talk about, questions for them to answer, but sometimes the most interesting insights come as a complete surprise, seemingly out of left field. So keep the conversation as open as you can and let them go on tangents and talk about what they wanna talk about. Come up with follow-up questions on the fly. So encourage them to go deeper. You can say something like, you mentioned X, Y, and Z. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Why does that matter to you? And when in doubt, keep asking why in order to get them to go deeper. So to wrap up, foundational research is not about the deliverable. So you might be tempted to say, okay, what comes out of this? You know, what can I put together that shows all my research? A research report is great. You can come up with design principles. That's all great. You can empathy map. All of these things are great, but your mission really is to figure out what problem to solve, what's important to users and how to provide value. You want to define the problem that you want to focus on and get to know the problem space better, understanding the user's needs, goals, and motivations. So I know it can be like a little bit weird for um, deliverable to not be the end result. So I just wanted to show you that if you are interested in what came out of my research um, and sort of how it informs my project, you can check out my case study at behance.net slash Maddie Beard, just to kind of round out the picture if you are super curious and don't wanna be left hanging. All right, thank you so much. I think that's all I have for the presentation. Um, if you're not already, go and say hi to me on Instagram. I'm at maddiebeard.ux. And I also have a YouTube channel that is just Maddie Beard. And very last thing, um, I invite you to go onto my website, mattybeard.com slash research planner. And here you can actually download a little um, worksheet for coming up with your research plan. So if you're brand new to this and you want a little bit of a guide, go um, and feel free to download this. You don't need to input your email or anything like that. It's totally free. So yeah, do that. And I hope that it's helpful. So now we can move on to some Q&A. Thank you so much. And I acknowledge you, Maddie. I do <laughs> acknowledge you. Thank you. <laughs> and I do acknowledge I the it. pumpkin spice talk in the chats and everyone. It's really, there was something sneaky you said. I don't I don't recall what it is. So someone might, might say it in the um, chat, but really good work, uh, Maddie. That's so funny. So, um, Let's see. At this time, we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature down below. Okay. So first question. So I'm, me, myself, I am still, I'm very new to uh, UX design as well. And I like research is one thing that really boggles my mind. And uh, I always like, I like talking to people, but I just, I always trying to figure out what the tangible part of 
what am I trying to find out? And uh, mm-hmm. this is a great start. Like this is really great, great start on like, you know, obviously con- uh, contrast and foundational versus directional and stuff like that. So okay. first question for you, do you think it matters whether you ask the same set of questions to each participant? Mm-hmm. I heard you can go deeper in a question with some participants, but I uh, was curious if you feel that matters. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, because of the nature of this type of interview, it's really free flowing. You may not always ask the same exact question to each person. And I personally think that's okay. Um, I should preface this by saying I'm not an interview expert. And that's why I really wanted to show you guys like the basics and kind of where I'm starting from and how I'm getting better at this. Um, So don't take my, you know, word as, you know, the absolute right answer. But for me personally, I've found that when something interesting comes out of an interview, I maybe it's like the third interview out of 12, something interesting comes out, then I know for the rest of the interviews that I want to ask about that. Um, And I want to, of course, ask it in a really broad, non-leading way, but I think you can have your interviews build off of each other so that you can get deeper and deeper as you go, because ultimately you're trying to figure out, um, you know, how to provide value to these people and no group of people is going to be a perfect group to compare and contrast like we're humans. And so I think it's really okay for it to be different each time and just learn something different from each person um, and compare and contrast when you can. Awesome. Um, Cause I, as myself, I've done some user research and I always, I, you did talk about this too, about, you know, being prepared for people that are, you know, they'll might give a one word answer compared to talking forever. You know, um, mm-hmm. my main question uh, about that process is like um there are times where you're just not getting the answer or getting a answer like a tangible answer from from the from the from the from the interviewee and sometimes they're just Mm -hmm. like they're not understanding what you're asking yeah is is that a an okay place to try a leading question that could lead to something else How, how do you feel about that Yeah, that's a good question when you're really not getting anything from someone and you want to get more specific to try to get them to understand. um, I think that's okay, but you should be careful. Um, If they're not really giving you a straight answer, that might also be because they just don't have a certain experience or they're not aware of a certain experience that they have. Maybe they just have never thought about, you know, how they perceive a certain um, task within your app or something like that. Um, So I will usually just completely move on because Mm -hmm. if someone's not naturally talking to me um, and trying to sort of pull answers out of of nowhere or just like kind of struggling to understand me, then a helpful, natural, truthful, honest answer probably isn't going to come out. So I usually like to move on and maybe um, if, if I'm able to think of a different way to ask the question later, then I'll do that. Oh, uh, that's true. And, and I guess that really does come down to planning because like you said, in, when you plan it, you'll, it's not only that you'll have that one question you're trying to get that information, but I feel mm-hmm. like with the planning and the stuff that you kind of prepare beforehand, you can get mm-hmm. that question, that, that answer, but maybe in a different way. So that's, yeah. that is great advice um another question when you spot pain points in foundational research during uh directional research okay what do you recommend to fill the gaps um is that a separate initiative or is that uh still part of your current directional research expansion of uh, research scope do you, did yeah. that make sense to you the question so i'll i'll answer it in a way that i think makes sense and you can okay. kind of like follow up Nicholas I'm sure sure you answered this if it's not really what you're asking but when it comes to foundational research that will come first and that should drive kind of what you start to build and then once you start to build something and you have a prototype and you're testing that prototype that's more the directional research Mm -hmm. so they really are two different things um and 
maybe you're asking, could something that comes out of the directional research then kind of feed back and maybe you need to start the process over again and do some mm -hmm. more foundational research? I think maybe that could that could happen, but you should be at a point with your directional research where you're testing very specific things and you have a goal and you sort of just need to move on, answer your questions and make the changes you need to make to, you know, fix the issues you're, you're learning about in your directional research and move on. So yeah. I think that's usually, that's usually the case, especially with a company that has a timeline and a budget. Yeah. Well, the thing is, once you, I think, like you said, you're very specific about that foundational research. Um, if you do find like your directional research uh, is based on the foundational. So if there's something missing, mm -hmm. it would have been found in, a, in the foundational side anyways. Is that Ideally. what I was thinking? Yeah. Okay. Ideally. Yes. And of course, that's not always going to, um, you know, yield your foundational research is really broad and it's not always going to inform perfectly everything you do. So you may come across issues later on, but it's just like any other process and, you know, project, you have to keep going. And if if something, if you come across an issue, you have to decide whether that's a big enough problem to go back or whether mm -hmm. you can move forward. Okay, that's great. That's awesome. Uh, when you plan your research, do you try to figure out what design problems might happen beforehand? Or is that kind of mm -hmm. like not even in question yet because you're you're still doing that, that basic research? Also, part of yeah. that, do you try to expose those problems with by solid data or do you try to avoid this like yeah that's a that? really good question i think yeah. it's hard not to whenever you're planning your foundational research it's hard not to um think about what the specific problem might be like and postulate about that and i think that's completely okay to do what you are really doing when you're doing foundational research is also testing your hypotheses so yeah. Maybe I have, you know, an idea in my head, like people have a problem um, when they're working from home so much, they have a problem switching between parts of their day. They often get stuck in work. I'm making that assumption because that's something I, you know, mm -hmm. experience. And yeah. so I want to test that. And so that's definitely also part of the foundational research and something that I have in the back of my head um, and something that I'm trying to either prove or disprove. Mm -hmm. uh okay so um do you feel that there's is there an optimal number of goals to have um also during planning how do you decide how long the interview should last i kind of think you've kind of touched on that a bit maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on like yeah. just timelines and stuff like that yeah yeah i think it really depends um and honestly when i was thinking about um how long my interviews should be I thought about all the topics that I wanted to cover and how much detail I wanted to get into and I sort of just guessed that it would take about you know 35 to 45 minutes and um, once I started doing them I realized it usually some ended up being like 20 minutes because like I said some people don't really like to talk a whole lot and some of them ended up being the full 40 or 45 minutes so it really is just um kind of a guess and check type of situation yeah. and remind me the first part of the question oh goals, goals so yeah. again I think it really it really depends I wouldn't I, I think it's similar to what I shared in the beginning always be willing to pivot and don't follow a specific rule so I don't want to mm. say a certain amount of goals you could have one goal you could have 10 goals I think it really depends um on the project and and the goals for foundational research, like you saw, are learn more about X, learn mm -hmm. more about Y, have a better understanding of Z. And so they're very broad, very broad goals. And so, yeah, you don't necessarily need to have a certain number. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned I'll always be pivoting because someone did ask, mm -hmm. um, oh, what do you mean by that? But so I think you kind of summed that up. Um, so yeah. uh, there was another question from the meetup group um, on, a, on a team of one. So, you know, mm -hmm. singular UX designer. Um, mm -hmm. What are some ways uh, to minimize the potential for a confirmation bias to uh, contaminate your research? 
Yeah, it, it's hard. I'm certainly not the best person to ask about this. I think you just, um, the, the few things I shared about staying really general and then moving to specific, that will help. Um, also, when you're on a team of one, you it's almost better because maybe you don't have a bunch of people who really want a specific end result. It's just you. And so you can, if you're aware of your own biases, then you can try to put those aside and um, just ask the questions, you know, as they come up and be, just try to be um, curious. Um, mm -hmm. And just because maybe your, your, um, hypothesis is disproven that doesn't mean that you're going to have to go back and spend months and months and months like don't have anxiety about what it means if you're not correct about your assumptions because that will help you be more open to what you know discovering what's really truly the, the main problem awesome so I think we have time for about one more question um there's two I want to ask but I have to Maybe I'll one. do a speed round. <laughs> okay, let's do let's do a 10 second speed round. Okay. okay. Hi Maddie, what is the ideal number of participants for a study? Mm, hi Jan. Jan is my friend. Okay. <laughs> hi, Jan. So I would say I like to have I've been doing 12. 12 has been a really good number mm -hmm. for me personally, but again, I really think that it depends. I think more than five or six is good but and the more you can do the better but just think about your timeline and your budget and do what you can that's kind of the thing about research is you can really only do what you're able to do within your constraints so okay. i go for 12. all right um second to last question uh, what part of the process do you find the most challenging Hmm, that's a good question. I think for me, the most challenging, this is going to sound weird, is just getting like geared up for the interviews. Like I get nervous, like really nervous for no reason about the interviews and yeah. they take a lot of energy out of me. So that's yeah. the first thing that comes to mind is just that week of having 12 45 minute interviews is really mm -hmm. exhausting for me. But afterwards, I feel like I like to make a lot of new friends and it's all, it's like really fun. So kind of pros and cons. Okay. Um, one last question. This is from me. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. Um, when trying to, uh, you know, give, um, how do I ask this? A lot of companies don't believe and don't put a lot of weight on UX research and mm -hmm. from what you've presented here, it just feels, and as a designer myself, um, I love when I get the research and I know exactly what the clientele or the user needs to design mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the product because I feel there's diff there's like less back and forth. There's more designing for the user compared to designing for the business in a sense. Yeah. So in your mind, how do you balance the business and the user and how do you get the business um, business buy-in to kind of to uh, put the money into something like that? Yeah, I think it's it's tricky. You sort of have to like as a freelancer, I have the privilege of being able to choose the companies mm -hmm. I work with. If they don't value research, then I'm not going to be able to work with them because I would have no idea how to design and how to mm -hmm. work. So. There's a little bit of that, but I think if I were to have to sell the concept of research to a client, I would just sort of give them an example of a product that would never work without research. Like, how are you going to know if someone would, I guess, like maybe repurchase oils? Like, so for my project, it's one of the big business um value propositions is repurchasing oil mm -hmm. and so we would want to know how would be the best way to tell someone that they're out of a certain oil tell someone that um, like invite someone to repurchase an oil there might be ways where someone would find that really annoying and just like turn off notifications or something but there are other ways that they might find it helpful we're never going to know what that what those differences are if we don't talk to 
the real people using them. So try to, I guess, pose it in a business from a business standpoint, and that might be helpful. Thank you so much, Maddie. That is, you did a wonderful job. Um, yeah. We that's all the time we have uh, to to talk today. Um, thank you again for sharing your expertise, and uh, we appreciate you being here. And just we're excited for your next talk, which is going to be designing micro interactions, November 9th. Um, if anyone has questions, uh, is there another place they can reach you other than, I think you post your Instagram and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, Instagram is, is definitely the best way to, to say hi. Awesome. All right, well, thank you, Maddie. All right, so. Thank you. Now it is time for our giveaway. Um, before we announce the winner, just want to invite you all to join us on our platforms once again. And uh, we're also, looking for more UXers to help uh, with future talks. If you guys want to be the me, uh, the face of the, of the hosting and our in the back doing the work, uh, you know, what Chana and Seiko and Shayla are doing, please contact Carrie or Seiko or just contact us on the Slack group. And uh, we'd love you to help us out.